Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Daisy Dunn. I'm Carbon Brew Special Correspondent. And I want to first apologize for the slight delay to this webinar starting, but I can see that everyone's joining the call now. So that's great. Um, our webinar today is the topic, how can carbon offsets be reformed? So all this week, Carbon Brief has been publishing a range of explainers, investigations, and analysis into carbon offsetting. So put simply, carbon offsets involve an entity that emits greenhouse gases into the atmosphere, paying for another entity to pollute less. So for example, an airline in a developed country might want to reduce claim it's making emissions reductions by paying for a patch of rainforest to be protected in the Amazon. The idea is that this can be an effective mechanism for polluting countries and companies to give money to projects that are good for the planet, especially in the developing worlds. However, a series of high profile investigations and scientific papers have shown that many carbon offset projects vastly overestimate their ability to reduce emissions and can come with devastating consequences for indigenous communities and local people. This is something that we've been exploring all week with our carbon offset series, and we're gonna be discussing it today with a wide range of experts from around the world. So I'm very pleased to introduce my colleagues who will be moderating this session. So my first colleague is Josh Gabatis, who is Carbon Brew's policy correspondent. And my second is Molly Limpari, who's Carbon Brew's policy section editor. And just a couple of housekeeping notes. We have about an hour for this session and we're going to start with some brief introductory remarks from our speakers and then we'll move over to a QA and a of the audience. During the session, please use the Q&A box, not the chat box, and we'll try to get to your questions. So thank you very much for joining us. I'm going to disappear now. Goodbye. Thanks, Daisy. Um, yeah, it's great to be joined by four fantastic panelists. Um, I wonder if Barbara, if you could kick us off by introducing yourself and sort of responding to how can carbon offsets be reformed? I think you're Hi. Hi, so I'm Barbara Haya. Um, I'm a research fellow at the Goldman School of Public Policy at UC Berkeley, and I direct the Berkeley Carbon Trading Project. And to answer the question, um, how can carbon offsets be reformed? I don't believe they can be reformed um, as carbon offsets. So I've been studying carbon offset quality for over 20 years. Um, from the Kyoto Protocols Offset Program, uh, where we documented, um, where we and others documented a large majority of those projects most likely would have gone ahead anyway and don't actually reduce emissions, to California's Offset Program, where the methods for estimating emissions reductions are systematically overcrediting, to the voluntary market, where I and others have had a hard time finding projects that are confidently not overcredited and methodologies that are not that are not uh, um, allowing for significant overcrediting. The level of overcrediting is really significant. We're not talking 20, 30 percent overcrediting. We're talking five times, 10 times, 12 times overcrediting. Um, and these credits are being used instead of companies making direct emissions reductions, they're being used to sell carbon neutral flights and fuel. And um, my uh, um, overall, uh, um, we just released a major report on red offsets, avoided deforestation, which is the project type with the most credits on the voluntary offset market. And we found, we, I and this team of researchers found really two different things. One is we were surprised to see overcrediting really under every rock we turned. And then two, um, what we we looked to try to understand why there was so much overcrediting. And we found that the methodologies, um, and it, is this too long? <laughs> Should I, is this okay? This, okay. Um, uh, uh, we found that the, just a little bit more. We found that the, the, the methodologies offered um, significant flexibility to developers in how to estimate emissions reductions, that the developers, of course, when there's uncertainty, were making choices that led to more credits rather than less credits. Why would they not? And that the third-party verifiers that were hired by the developers to review uh, the, the carbon calculations 
we're not doing their job ensuring that the choices were conservative. Um, and often they didn't ensure that they were reasonably accurate or reasonable. And our team ended up concluding that the offset market is, is structured to overcredit because everyone involved in the making of an offset credit benefits from more credits. And you get large quantities of overcrediting because decisions along the life cycle of the offset program or the, um, from the writing of the methodology to the, the buyers who want cheap credits, it's a compounding of, of, of decisions that lean towards overcrediting, which is why we get these very large quantities of overcrediting. So in the end, um, I will argue that we need to move away from offsets. I don't see a way to fix this market. And I think what we need to do is move towards a contributions approach. For one, we need to move away from offsets and double down on prioritizing, reducing our own emissions. And then we need to create easy ways for those who want to do more to find projects and programs to support as contributions, but not as offsets. Thank you, Barbara. That's that's a really that's a really um, uh, great intro. Um, next, we'll move on to Kaya Kaya Axelson, who is uh, a net zero. Uh, Net Zero Policy Engagement Fellow at the University of Oxford and um, one of the brains behind the Oxford Offsetting Principles, which is, uh, I'm sure Kaya can explain to you now. Um, Kaya, would you want to give yourself a little intro? Yeah, sure. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be on this panel with um, people's work that I've been reading for a long time. And I want to start out by saying that um, we at Oxford titled them the net zero aligned Oxford offsetting principles, kind of as a grab, but really to highlight actually how little of the market is providing a net zero aligned offsetting option. Um, you know, looking at uh, Dr. Haya's own database and, and looking at how little, and you've commented this on this in your in your work, Josh, just looking at how little of the voluntary carbon market has any credible removals in it at all, let alone removals with long-term storage, suggests that most of the market is not fit for purpose to balance sinks and sources on a basic level. And then if you look at the incredible amount of emissions reductions offsets um, in the market and their quality it's not a market reform problem as as dr Hayes has pointed out it's a it's a question of the projects themselves and what they're selling and the incentive structures to keep prices low and to exploit communities for their ecosystem services if they're they are kind of you know removals through forest projects um i think facts and stats are as important as as stories and i was at cop last year and i was sharing a hotel room with the ecuadorian indigenous community who were there to ask for their money because they hadn't been paid for many many years for the services that they'd been providing and so we have to consider how markets continue to exploit people um, and how middlemen get paid for these kinds of um, projects but that sometimes that money doesn't trickle down do I think overall that, you know, if the, all the projects in the market are bad projects? No, I've talked to a lot of really amazing projects about the work that they're doing, the co-benefits they provide. And I wouldn't want all those projects to go away just because I think that the market is broken and, you know, and, and it's not delivering on what it promises. Um, and so I think I agree that we need another way to incentivize and transition some of the amazing work that's going on on the ground. Um, I guess what I would say is that um, there's a few a few things that we highlight in the Oxford Offsetting Principles that there's the issue of you know the need to um, invest in in things uh, after or not after but as alongside deep emissions reductions as like the first principle I think everybody knows that but then as your piece points out a huge amount of those who are paying for offsets now are those industries that are, as we know, not making those deep cuts. So the fossil industry and the, the Yeah, it looks it looks like Kaya is having a almost as much as we can kind of in our scope one in, at one 
Oh, can you hear me? Sorry, you just you you cut out for a moment there, but you might want to just repeat the, the last uh, twenty seconds. Yeah. Yeah, so there's there's an interesting angle here as well about the budgets of some of these very large companies that are investing in offsets or rec credits for their scope too. And if you look at them, I mean, some of these large companies have billions in their sustainability budget, which is great. We want to keep that money in that sustainability budget. But is investing in market-based mechanisms the right approach for those companies? What if those companies invested billions that they have in their budget in decommissioning all the coal facilities in the U.S.? you know, directly, as opposed to working in through a market that has many middlemen and that has, you know, the potential to have low additionality um, in some of the projects. Um, why don't we start from an outcomes-based framework in sustainability in terms of what we want to achieve? We've all agreed internationally it's time to phase out coal, but we haven't delivered. So what if, you know, uh, a company was like, that's the best thing that we can do to reduce scope two emissions for everybody is invest a ton in decommissioning coal facilities. And then let's look at our next order priority. What do we need to get done as a community? I think I'm really excited by some of the um, aggregated uh, purchaser coalitions that I'm starting to see as an alternative to traditional carbon credit and offset markets. So I'll stop there because there's lots more to discuss. That was really interesting. Thanks, Kaya. Our next uh, panelist is Laura. I wonder if, Laura, you could introduce yourself and just quickly answer um, our key question. How can carbon offsets be reformed? Thank you. I'm Laura. I'm from Guyana, from the Amerindian People's Association, a, an Indigenous People's Advocacy Organization. Uh, so, how can carbon offsets be reformed? Our experience in Guyana as an Indigenous People's um, Rights Advocate, we have our experience shows that if Indigenous peoples are not made center and included in national decision making. It is in the design of what we may want to be involved in, in the whole carbon trade. It, it is not going to be effective other than to mislead indigenous peoples to feel that we're going to get all of these monies, but really not understanding of whether we should be, or we would like to be involved and whether we should give our consent to being included in carbon trade such as this. So how should that be reformed? First and center, it has to be government, a combination of government, the financial sector, the indigenous peoples who are all, um, especially for indigenous peoples, to be very much respected and considered as the ones driving this and that can only happen if indigenous peoples are informed that we can probably properly participate and give our consent to the design and implementation on, on progress. Fantastic. Uh, thank you, Laura. That's 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 great. Um, some really interesting uh, different perspectives coming in here. Um, finally, our, our fourth speaker is Pedro Barata, who's uh, the Associate Vice President of Carbon Markets at the Environmental Defence Fund, and also co-chair of the Integrity Council for the Voluntary Carbon Market for Voluntary Carbon Markets. I think that's I think I got that right. It's one of the uh, various initiatives to um, uh, in, to examine and. and Think about ways in which the voluntary carbon market can be done better and again i'm sure pedro can fill you in on all that great Josh, uh, thank you for the for the introduction uh let me just correct you on on one point i'm not the co-chair of the integrity council i'm the co-chair of the expert panel of the integrity council so one floor below the the the, the council itself um and and uh but i am sort of representing uh, ICVCM uh, in this context. So the, the first thing I wanted to say around uh, the, the, the question as it's put, I want to correct a little bit the question uh, or, or clarify the question. The, the question has been put as how carbon offsets can be, um, what is it, the, the, the actual question, how can carbon offsets be um, formed? Sure. Right. Uh, so 
what we're talking about most of the times is carbon credits. In, in my very simple world, you either have, as, as carbon units go, you either have allowances for emissions trading systems or carbon credits from baseline and credit systems. When you say offsetting or, or offset, you're referring to a particular use case, which is a compensation claim on the demand side. So I think it's important to understand what is the, what is the debate here going to be about? Is it about carbon credit quality? Is it can it be reformed, or is it about the the use claim of offsetting? Is it is it fit for purpose? I have views on both, uh, but let's start with um, carbon credit and can it be reformed? I remember, uh, like Barbara, I was heavily involved in the in the CDM. I I was part of the executive board for a number of years. And we did, to an extent, reform the system. But I acknowledge, with Barbara, I acknowledge that there are inherent uh, difficulties in, in, with, with a crediting framework. For example, you need to take care of conflicts of interest. You need to align um, the regulators and the regulatees on a, 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 a common purpose. And oftentimes, you'll see that if you don't have that alignment, you'll see that you have um, abuse, let's put it this way, of the position of those who, you know, the third party validators, for example, will be more inclined to you know, take a pass on, on, on checking the quality of credit if there isn't a strong regulator in, in place. So um, in a way, I, I do share, I, I'm not ex exactly on the same page with Barbara in, in particular on, on her analysis or scientific analysis. Um, I wouldn't dispute it because I, I'm not the scientist here. Uh, but I do share the concern that without a strong regulatory framework, you do have a, a, a system where it's everyone for, for, for themselves. Uh, nobody checks the, the quality. Uh, the buyer and the, and the seller are both, let's put it this way, with a shared interest in, in uh, perverting the system. But you can change things. So to take one notorious example under the CDM, we had this huge problem of HFC 23 over crediting that we found. First of all, it was an independent uh, research that found it. It was actually the, the regulator that found it. It corrected uh, the, 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 the mistake to the point that for a number of years, AJC 23 projects were actually under crediting. So they were, in fact, providing without the benefit of the Kyoto Protocol being forced, they were providing for a number of years actual uh, mitigation uh, contribution, if you want, or a net zero, whatever you want to call it. Um, so would agree with Barbara, uh, again, on, on the flexibility. I do not agree, um, just a very quick point. If, if there is a new mitigation contribution approach, I would hesitate to say that that is in any way different in terms of the demands that we should have on the credits and, and the quality. In other words, if I'm going to replace an offsetting claim with a contribution claim, I don't see any reason why we should be laxer on additionality, laxer on validation, verification, etc. And oftentimes, I see NGOs that are coming forward with this mitigation contribution saying, oh, well, and you know what? It would be easier, for instance, we could actually relax a little bit on our additionality, on our permanence uh, um, um, claims. Sorry to say, I, I, I don't see it that way. Even if you're just in the scope of contribution, um, I, would, I would hesitate to do that. Uh, and finally, on this, uh, potential conflict between offsetting and, and the frameworks and the idea that offsetting gives a free pass to companies. First of all, there are now um, other initiatives like the Science-Based Targets Initiative that is inherently about that, uh, making sure that we, we can trust the trajectories and the pathways that, that companies are uh, going uh, on in terms of net zero. And there's also evidence that those companies that commit to those pathways are both reducing internally and that the companies that are reducing most internally are also the ones that are buying the most credits. Um, and, and there's re recent research to, to that in terms of, of service and, and actual cross-checking uh, of that. Now, I'm worried about credit quality uh, very much, uh, and that's why the ICBCM has been set up. And we do hope that over the next few months, we'll be able to change significantly the landscape of, of carbon credits. So I'm not as, as um, disparaging, put it this way, on those prospects as, as I think Barbara was, was uh, indicating she was. 
Thanks, Pedro. And yeah, it's great to have different opinions from so many different experts, um, which hopefully should make us a very lively discussion. Um, to sort of kick us off, um, you sort of fed into it quite well, Pedro, but um, who should lead in reforming carbon offsets? Should it be registries? Should it be governance bodies or buyers themselves? Barbara, I wonder if you could kick us off with an answer to that. So, um, yeah, I think I, I think the distinction that Pedro was just saying about, um, well, you can have offsets and you can have contributions that are also credit based, but then you can also have contributions that are not credit based. So, um, I think the answer is all of the above, meaning for for the credit-based contributions, um, we need you know, buyers who care about quality. We need ultimately the, the registries. Um, they're the rule writers and they, they need to rewrite the rules so that over the portfolios of projects, we're not over crediting. You need strong governance um, uh, to in, help ensure um, that claims can't be made based on false credits um, and to support uh, quality, to support quality. Um, and I think we also, all of the above needs to be thinking about an alternative to the current system, an alternative contributions approach that's not based on creating a set of rules and letting the market go, but is based on, as Kaya was saying, <clears throat> a focus on looking at where the fun, where funds can really make a difference and programs that companies and others can support to uh, uh, to do to do those things where you move away from the issues of quantification and additionality, et cetera, into putting money into places where we know that money is really needed and can make a difference. I just I I feel that we've um, we're talking about a uh, kind of contribution approach, and it's something that uh, a few of the questions that have come in have asked about this and whether this could be a sort of viable alternative model. So I wonder if maybe someone could just come in and just kind of explain in more layman's terms what this would mean um, in the in in the sort of grand scheme of of carbon offsets. I I, I know Kaya, you said that you were interested in speaking to this, so perhaps you could just. Uh, explain briefly what, what that would mean. Yeah, this is a really live topic. Um, I'd actually love to hear from the other panelists on this as well, um, because it's something that my team is doing some thinking and research on. How do we reform the standards and policy landscape so that we can ignore, so we can give companies a place to talk about some of the good that they're doing without shoving those things into inventories? I think you know Pedro make, made an important distinction between an offset and a credit right? Um, an offset is something you use to say, we've done some bad emissions over here, and we want to, you know, say that we've taken down emissions uh, in a one-for-one -one balance. And there's been a lot of criticism of that type of maths. Um, but that's because we've really only given companies our, their greenhouse gas inventories as a way to talk about their effect on society in terms of, you know, helping us meet the global net zero goal. And it's my view that we need to give companies a separate kind of incentive structure to talk about their contribution in wider society. This is representing a fundamental shift in how we think about companies as like strict legal individual entities or rather players in a wider system. And so I'm kind of working on a paper talking about um, going beyond in inventories into intervention. I froze. Perhaps their policy and advocacy, perhaps their systemic interventions. Um, they're working in, uh, someone in the chat was asking about these kind of aggregated demand coalitions. That could be something like the LEAF coalition or this new frontier coalition. It's, a, it's when companies get together and they say, we're going to... Um, as purchasers say that we're going to invest in um, these these service that we agree on, and it kind of deeps the investment for um, companies or innovators who need to create that service. 
So um, these are kind of alternatives to your typical credit approach. Um, and I think that these types of systemic interventions, they, we have, or even investing in your own product innovation so that you have avoided emissions as a result of your investments internally that wouldn't necessarily fit into your scope three. These are all things that we need to give a place for companies to talk about as their kind of contribution to, you know, global net zero. So there's your personal net zero goal, and then there's your kind of global net zero contribution. I don't think we've figured out exactly how to incentivize those structures yet. Would anyone else like to speak to the, this this question? If I may, I have I do have comments on on both uh, Barbara's and and, uh, and Kaya's. Uh, Barbara, I think you were saying at some point that we should move to a contribution claim where companies can say, and then you said, and, and I I, I uh, noted down, you can show that you can make a difference. So that that goes back to my point. If you have to show that you're making a difference, that is essentially, it doesn't matter whether you're, you're quantifying or not, but that's essentially about additionality. Is you don't what you don't want globally. We have scarce resources, so what you don't want globally is for a lot of companies to say, "Hey, I'm contributing to the Amazon," or "I'm contributing to whatever," and yet not having some mechanism by which you say, "Well, how is it different from what?" You, I mean, the thing that you're contributing to or that you're financing, how is it different from what whatever was happening? This applies for everything we do, whether we're talking about policy level, jurisdictional approaches, uh, project based. So I think that the point being here, to me, from a quality perspective, I don't think a contribution claim is anything different from or should be anything different from what we are trying to get in terms of a crediting claim. Then the other thing I would push back a little bit on, sorry uh, for being so contrarian, is this notion that because the world as a whole needs to get to net zero by as soon as possible, but by 2050, let's say, that a company should now be prevented, whether it's contribution or, um, or offset, whatever the claim may be, from investing in, in reductions beyond their value chain. I see or the idea that somehow we should be promoting removals at the cost of reductions. We don't have right now enough mitigation to go around, just globally. So I'll take whatever mitigation I can get if it's, again, credibly uh, uh, checked, verified, etc. I'll take any reduction. And yes, I will take any removal as possible. But right now, the cost, the technological cost of tech-based removals, for example, is several times several factors of magnitude higher than the cost of emission reductions. And so I don't see any particular ethical problem with saying to companies, do your best internally, do your science-based targets, and then go out and buy as many emission reductions. And whatever you want to claim, I mean, that's that's a separate exercise. You can claim it against any type of, of, of good do-gooding, good, do but um, but I don't see that that is, that should stand in that our our focus on removals at some point in net zero in global net zero should stand in the way of emission reductions right now. Laura and Barbara, you both have your hands up. Laura, I wonder if you want to go first. Oh, sorry. Uh, yeah, I I wanted to add to you know how do you do that? So for Pedro and for both Barbara and Pedro, I think our situation in Guyana lies somewhere in between. Guyana has this jurisdictional um, approach there, but what we have experienced is that with even standards that are there, it because standards have been designed without indigenous peoples, at least in the case of Guyana, indigenous peoples not knowing what they speak to, not knowing what a good appeal process or a complaint or appeal process may look like. It has taken away from indigenous people's rights in the case of being involved and being able to access these properly and even understanding what this actually means in the case of what jurisdictional uh, approach means or what it means for indigenous people's rights or for us to be included. I don't know if I wanted to quickly, um, I don't know if I wanted to quickly Hey, I was trying to see how I can 
sorry. I was trying to see I can quickly bring up this map of Guyana to show you why it's such a different setting where the majority of the population live along the coast of Guyana, which is non-forested. Um, and that is not indigenous peoples. The indigenous peoples that make up like 12% of just around 800,000 Guyanese live in the forested highlands, in the savannas, in the waters. So it really is a lands of indigenous peoples and territories that we have been living on, protecting and everything else. So, and the hinterland of Guyana, we've had very little connectivity to be included, you know, like internet is limited or no internet connectivity. So it, it has had these challenges where indigenous peoples have been left behind in being fully and participatory in all of these decision-making and, and the design of what Guyana has been offering. And now what the, the credit um, sale has been so far. Going forward, how might we look at this? It would be constantly calling for a, uh, a combination of approach where we have, as I said, uh, governments, indigenous peoples, um, the financial sector, and especially as we are also saying, academia and research that provides and supports indigenous people's positions, our mm -hmm. concerns, and our contribution and input toward successful, if it can be successful, um, um, reforms and this, you know, decisions. Barbara, do you want to finish off that question? Sure, and yeah, I really appreciate what you what you just said, Laura. Um, uh, I thought it might be helpful to uh, um, distinguish offsets from contributions. So this this might be helpful. Is I think fundamentally what a contributions approach means is that you're not netting out your total emissions. Mm -hmm. So just very fundamentally um uh with offsets you can claim net zero if you emit and you buy credits with a contributions approach you can't say or claim a net number you have to uh uh claim what you've emitted or maybe what you've reduced directly and then you can say another uh number of what you've done otherwise and i think that we can think of contributions as maybe two different types. One is contributions that are offsets where you just are making a different claim, sort of based on the carbon credit. Or, and what I'm really most ex excited about exploring as a contributions approach is going a step further and um, not, not using the current offset market, but developing al alternative ways or companies already have alternative ways to support climate mitigation that's not necessarily through the offset market. And I think for many reasons that can be more effective than what we've seen so far with, with carbon offsets. It's really helpful to have those clarifications. I know both Pedro and Kaya have their hands up. Um, I am slightly conscious that we've got about 20 more minutes. Are there quick points that you'd both like to make and then we'll move on to some of our questions from the audience. Yes. Um... Just on on Laura's point uh, and her experience in Guyana, just to say, on behalf of the ICVCM, and first of all, my my personal experience in in these markets is is, is that if there is something even worse than the environmental integrity uh, uh, problems that Barbara uh, is is talking about or has researched uh, at length, is sometimes the the claims of social. Um, and, and to be honest, even human rights uh, uh, violations on the back of things like CDM projects. And I wouldn't want to be in a market, put it this way, that has this, this taint on it. Uh, so one of the things that I think is really important is that I think over the last 10 years, we've seen a, a major shift from this focus on um, environmental integrity alone being about additionality and permanence and getting the emissions accounting right, to broadening a bit the, the idea of environmental integrity and, and, and broadening it to social integrity, making sure that people on the ground are respected, they are getting the benefits. And just to note that the ICVCM has these as core carbon principles as well, environmental and social safeguards. And then on top of that, we are putting together a 
an IPLC, Indigenous People and Local Communities uh, Stakeholder uh, um, Forum. I hope, to, to be honest, and, and uh, this is a, an internal message, I hope that this is not just a window dressing or anything. I do hope and I feel that commitment from uh, other people uh, within this, that we are really there to listen to these Indigenous peoples, to their experience, and making sure that we can work to um, to address some of the, the, the very you know, basic shortcomings uh, with respect to their participation. So just a, this, this, yeah, pitch for the ICVCM work. Yeah, I just want to add that um, I think the biggest uh, ethical problem with the offset market is that we think of it like a market and it's something where we could just go buy something and then forget about all of the benefits that we're claiming that it supposedly is attached to. Um, a friend of mine once said um, offsets are like like pets they're for they're not just for christmas they're forever once you've claimed this benefit you have to be paying attention to it you have to be thinking and i think the biggest danger of us thinking about it in this kind of consumerist way is that um companies um it's true pedro has said that it's the companies that are um you know kind of better in and let's be clear no company is doing what we need it to do at the moment like in terms of its net zero um you know you can look at the net zero tracker and see its progress um but it is the companies that are better that are investing the most in credits but that doesn't mean that we shouldn't be thinking you know what could they be doing more um uh, or what could they be doing instead of the that so i think it's kind of like a lazy approach potentially to just be like, oh, I've invested my credit and it's retired and then I'm done. I've washed my hands of it. You know, additionality is something you have to be like very watchful of permanence that, that uh, the most recent, and Pedro, this is something I'd love to pick up with you, but the mo most recent documents I've seen from the ICVCM list permanence at a very kind of low bar and, and in terms of very kind of short-term timescales. And we know carbon lasts in the atmosphere for thousands of years. So I'm very concerned about the permanence element. And that's something that, you know, know if if things don't work out with a project and we've claimed uh, removal with storage um then and it gets re-released then the company needs to reconsider if it's if it has claimed a net based on that whether it is still net zero and so so it companies have to be diligent even after they've purchased and retired the credit right they have to be paying attention so that's why i really like kind of barbara's perspective that um we need to have a fundamental shift in the way that we're thinking about um, these projects that we're investing in, we need to kind of um, curate them and take care with them, make sure the communities, to Laura's point, are involved on an ongoing basis. We can't just buy and then be comfortable letting that go. Um, and then I think that there, there's another really important ethical issue about who gets to offset and where and why. And ultimately, to answer your question originally, Josh, the people that need to be fixing these markets, I think it needs to be regulated because right now we do have a really big problem. I mean, I don't know if you guys just saw, but the UAE has just invested a huge amount to and the headline was, um, uh, that Liberia has conceded territory in the amount of 1 million hectares to to, to, to the UAE to do whatever it wants in terms of offsetting. Now, that is just fundamentally wrong if we think about what that land could be used for, the local people and how they kind of get to decide what they want to do with their land. Um, and the UAE's emissions are fossil emissions that probably shouldn't be offset through, you know, nature-based offsets in another country. And so, um, or sold. Uh, and, and so we have, I think, a fundamental issue of um, of integrity that is going to need regulation. Um, and I'm just not so optimistic that our voluntary frameworks have um, gone far enough or can go far enough to fix that. Thanks, everyone. This is proving to be a very spirited discussion, um, as we as we predicted. Um, thank you for all your uh, perspectives. I'm going to try and crack on with a few of the, the questions coming in from our audience now, because there have been quite a few. Um, so a, a lot of people will be familiar with offsetting through the various investigations that have been done um, and have been widely publicized in, in uh, news media. Uh, a lot of these are focused on Red Plus projects, which are sort of uh, forest preservation projects, which are then used to generate um, offsets. Um, so there's a couple of questions coming in about Red Plus. Uh, one is, you know, uh, are your concerns only about Red Plus projects or also about others? Um, and the other is is about what will happen to red plus projects that depend on carbon financing so i guess the implication there is you know if if 
if this market was discredited, what would happen to those those projects? Um, I guess any of you could really take this, but is is there anyone in particular who would who would like to start us off talking about Red Plus? Uh, I will go to Barbara. I know that you have to uh, you have to leave us a little bit early, so if you would like to speak to this, then I'll I'll, I'll pass it to you. Sure. Um, um, and 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 forgive me. Say, say really quickly what the two questions were. The, the first question was. Uh, are we only talking about red plus here and the second question was essentially if the if the funding isn't coming to red plus projects through carbon offsetting you know what will happen to those projects great so my my concern is and is not just red plus so i've reviewed i and others have reviewed looked at the quality of credits across many different project types and the quality challenges are widespread across voluntary and compliance markets. Um, with Red Plus, there's an additional, or more so, there's a, a, a human rights risk issue, which makes it even more compelling to move away from an offsetting approach. And for, for projects, um, what we've seen is that there's with red, there's really widespread over crediting, and those credits, for the most part, should not be used as offsetting today. Um, and a contributions approach create creates a way for, or maybe opens the door for um, companies and others to look at the wide variety of red plus projects on the ground, um, and look at. Who, which ones are really wor more worth supporting and recalculating the emissions the emissions benefit or just using it as a contribution. Um, and that's just to say, I think with, with RED, there's some really wonderful projects and then there's really a, a gamut of, of outcomes for people and for the climate from these, from these different projects. Laura, perhaps you would uh, want to speak on this just because as a, you know, as someone from a, a, a very forested country, which is where red, a lot of Red Plus projects are based, I think this is probably pertinent for you. Uh, okay, I, I don't want to sound so negative, but <laughs> we've had an ongoing uh, project to title, to, to have legally recognized lands of indigenous peoples the Arena Land Title, the ALT project with funding from Norway. This started in, in 2013. 10 years later, we are still to get it, you know, past halfway of the project. Um, because for Red Plus projects to be successful, it has required, there is, a, you know, enhanced um, legislation, a reform of legislation where it's needed or a complete legal reform, um, you know, a strong uh, strengthening of the legal reform or restructuring it. So it has been a challenge in having what might be successful a Red Plus projects. In the meantime, though, there has been an increase in um, concessions being granted over lands mostly us also over territories of indigenous peoples. And as I said, I'm sorry, I cannot show you this map that maybe I should have sent it to you because as indigenous peoples, we also have solutions where we have been working with communities to map out territories of indigenous peoples of our lands then that we use and occupy that are important to us. And that also as indigenous peoples, if these you know, legal recognition can be granted over territories of our lands. It is going to contribute to us as a country, protecting our forests, our natural um, habitats, keeping our waters healthy and all of these things. So might any funding coming from the carbon trade, the carbon markets, would that affect us? Um, it should not, it should not, affect projects that are already ongoing at the moment for Guyana because there are there is financing that is still to be expended 
again, so it raises the question of what is it? Well, where is the gap then that there has not been a successful implementation of projects in the country? There are some where monies have been spent, but the actual projects are still to be seen. So for example, internet connectivity to the hinterland region. There was such a project allocated, so yeah, uh, there's a project outlined in the previous, our low carbon development strategy plan. The communities are still to really get a proper internet connectivity in the hinterland. So again, it brings back the question of where there have been these grant plans globally that come to the country, but again, ownership and inclusion of indigenous peoples need to be part and parcel of the driving force of the design and project implementations and programs if indigenous peoples are so informed and if we give or withhold our consent. And all of those need to be there to ensure whether these whole carbon trade and whether it's the offset, if these are really working for us, indigenous peoples also need to understand and be able to see whether they give consent to such programs like this that our national, you know, the government gets involved in coming from what is there in the, in the global space. Thank you, Laura. Uh, Pedro, I'll just go to you because you've got your hand up there. Yeah, very quickly. Uh, first, to agree with Barbara, historically, this is not, uh, let put it this way, Red Plus is just one of many categories of projects that have had problems uh, identified. And we've seen with industrial gases, with renewable energy, we've seen problems related to additionality, et cetera. On the other hand, red and just generically nature-based solutions are, uh, first of all, they're starved of finance elsewhere, uh, much more so than, for instance, renewable energy, which in fact is one of the reasons why um, many claim that renewable energies in many geographies are no longer additional. They are effectively already cost-effective. That's not the case for nature-based solutions, not the case for many red uh, uh, activities where you don't have any other revenue but carbon. And so what's really uh, crucial is that when we reform the red plus pipeline, we address issues of uh, baselining. And I think that those are uh, being addressed in, at least in, in, or in the prospect of being addressed. Um, but we also address issues of free prior informed consent uh, from uh, Indigenous peoples. And, uh, and personally, I would love to see uh, Indigenous peoples and their representatives actually take ownership, put it this way, of the project development, of project monitoring, so that we are not faced with um, this, this type of um, the accusations, put it this way. And in the end, that we live up to this idea that the um, indigenous peoples are the guardians, so to speak, of the forest, and so they should be the ones be getting the rewards. Thanks, Pedro. Uh, the next question we have is from Teresa Anderson, who says the World Bank's annual State of Carbon Markets reports, which they stopped publishing in 2013, showed that less than 0.1% of global carbon market value went to communities on the ground. Do you have a sense that these numbers are still consistent today? Um, Barbara, I wonder if you could kick us off with that one. And, and the, I'll pass on that because I haven't really looked at the you know, flow, of, flow of funds. Can I just correct the, the, the it's, it's been, it's, it's changed its name, but the, the, the report is still happening. There's an annual report called State and Trends. I think currently it's called State and Trends of Carbon Pricing. I don't know the latest figures for uh, the benefits accruing to indigenous peoples, but bear in mind that throughout, since 2013 until now, as a whole, the crediting market has collapsed pretty much. Uh, even now, we're, we're, we're at much smaller uh, volumes than the ones during the clean development mechanism. So my expectation would just typically, and, and without doing any uh, calculation, would be that the numbers have actually gone down just simply because the carbon market itself has gone down in volume. Uh, 
Um, we've probably got time for a couple more questions if we're if we're relatively quick. Um, I will go. So I haven't been saying people's names, but uh, you know who you are if uh, if we've said your your questions. I've got one here from Fatima Bakhtari, who's asking about um, Article Six carbon markets. Um, so this is an interesting one. We've not really touched on this. Um, could you please share your views on Article Six? Um, with regards to the challenges of using carbon offsets, you know, is this is this new carbon market? Are these new carbon markets uh, going to be an improvement, uh, a chance for reform? What do you think, um, Akaya? I think we've not heard from you for a while. Perhaps you could speak to this. Yeah. So I think um, in general we have an issue where a lot of our modeling like our global modeling um and then our kind of assumptions as to what can be claimed in ndcs um and the voluntary carbon market are not talking to each other um and i think that we've made a bit of progress in article 6 but i don't think that we're anywhere near making the kind of progress that would make us comfortable um that there's not going to be double counting i mean i think and this is very political and it's very difficult and i i personally don't think that this is going to be resolved through the UNF triple C process. That's just my personal view that um, that we need to be really diligent in the private sector about this, um, assuming that a lot of land is going to be claimed in NDCs that people are going to also want to claim in the private market. I spoke with my um, my physics professor, the director of my institute, who was kind of the originator of the term uh, net zero. And he was like, I almost want to call a recall on that term because of the way it's being used. Um, because we, when we kind of put that forward, we, we didn't realize that the kind of modeling that was going to be relied on in terms of, you know, the UNFCCC process and what people could claim um, in terms of land and the removables available through land, which are, let's be honest, a lot of removables that are being modeled are happening because of previous emissions, right? Previous emissions um, are leading to the kind of increased uptake through nature um, of uh, and so that's a that's a huge problem if we're kind of counting on those rates, but it's actually historical emissions and we're kind of casting that forward. I think there's a huge issue in translation of science here. Um, and we should be assuming that there's going to be quite a bit of double counting. And, and um, I'm not really sure that, um, yeah, tr trusting nationally uh, determined, I mean, our NDCs are not even um, incomparable units, right? Some countries are reporting their NDCs in gigawatt hours. So that doesn't even make sense to translate that into the land use problem. Um, so I guess what I would say is it only what we've all been saying, if you're going to be buying offsets through a private mechanism, here's just one more thing to be diligent of, uh, is it being counted in a nationally uh, determined contribution already? I should just say I uh, should have explained what Article 6 is uh, for anyone uh, not in the know. Um, it's the new, U it covers the new UN carbon markets, which, inc which includes trading in carbon credits and NDCs are climate uh, targets set by by countries which uh, may use these credits to, to reach their targets. Um, we'll just go quickly to Pedro and then I think we've got, we'll do one final question and then that'll be that'll be the end. Yeah, I just wanted to explain a little bit. The, the Article 6 essentially allows for anything that is mitigation to be translated into a, a common unit. And I agree totally with Kaya. There are, there's going to be a lot of strange conversions in, into that common unit. But the idea is that just like in the Kyoto Protocol days, you could have uh, international emissions trading between uh, countries. Inherently, there's nothing particularly wrong as long as, and, the, and it, this made it to the to the final agreement, um, as long as you don't double count. So within countries or uh, across countries, if I am transferring, as, as the, the article says, a mitigation outcome to another country, I cannot any longer claim that against my NDC. And that's what a corresponding adjustment is. Now, there is... A, a huge debate, and I, I sense that I'm probably again uh, in the minority here within this, this group, about whether that particular requirement of corresponding adjustments should apply when 
say Pedro Barata goes and um, buys uh, carbon credits from a project in Brazil and then wants to use to claim that he is neutral in Portugal. Now, strictly speaking, and I'm going to be very, uh, uh, yeah, uh, very Teutonic here. Strictly speaking, there is no double counting because the using the voluntary carbon market because the Brazilian reduction will show up if it's if it is a reduction, if it's additional, et cetera, et cetera, it will show up in the national inventory, but I'm not counting anything towards the national inventory of Portugal. The Portuguese government is none the wiser. There are, however, real issues, and, and we've had several discussions within ICVCM as to how to deal with this, which is about incentives. If we have a lot of private finance going to Brazil um, to get let's say their hands on on these uh, opportunities will that displace brazilian owned domestic action more so than the the, the question about the the offset use for myself which is a different uh, claims perspective so the the jury is out on that and uh, both icvcm and vcmi have uh, joined hands in trying to solve that but i i can already anticipate this is going to be an extremely difficult issue Thanks, Pedro. And as it is full, we are going to have to bring this to a close. So I'm going to ask one final question. And I wonder if all four panelists could, in 30 seconds or less, um, come up with an answer to it, if at all possible. So the question is from Patrick, Patrick Greenfield, who said, given the abject failure of carbon market industry leaders to provide credibility, is it right that those that have overseen this mess continue to try to find a solution? Or are they simply not up to the job? Um, Barbara? Thanks. So, um, as I said at the at the very beginning, uh, you know, I've studied carbon offset quality for twenty years. I'm having the same conversations now about poor quality that I had twenty years ago, and I think technically it's possible to have a quality market where it's independent researchers who help write the methodologies and the verification process is done independently. Um, but after this amount of time and after such high levels of poor quality, I really think I'm not optimistic about being able to fix it now. And I think we need to move to, to an entirely different to an entirely different approach. Um, and let me just say, uh, uh, for uh, I'm happy to answer emails uh, via email um, that we that we didn't get to in the Q&A. Feel free to email me. Thanks, Barbara. Shaya? Yeah, I guess I would just say that um, I think that we saw boom and bust cycle in the kind of early mid two thousand, like early two thousands, like two thousand eleven, and I think that the folks at the VCMI and ICVCM have been working really hard to we you know see that we're about we were, there was a boom around the time that Greta people even called it the Greta effect, which I think she would hate. Greta was speaking up and there was a huge boom in the, the, the voluntary carbon market. People were buying lots and then there was lots of concern over greenwashing and now we're seeing it contract again. And um, and I really appreciate that people are like, look, we we cannot afford money to stop flowing into mitigation projects. And I think that was you know Pedro's comment at the start. We need every bit we can get and we need to reduce emissions very quickly. And so I just want to be clear that Oxford, we're not saying stop investing in reduction in parts of the world that need that financing now. I think the fundamental debate is whether the market is fit for purpose. Um, or whether there are more creative um, ways to, to do that mitigation and to invest in the removals and storage that we need. We need between two and four gigatons annually, annually until 2050. We're nowhere near that amount. Our state of removals report shows that. So, you know, either way, we need to fix how many removals are in the market and add a lot of removals with long-term storage to the market or find other ways of financing it, just as we need to find other ways of financing mitigation efforts. I really think that whatever you do, if you decide that markets are your approach, that's kind of like an ideological position. Or if you find another way of doing that, we need to be very diligent in how we invest. It doesn't, you're not, you, the, the last thing I'll say, and I've said it before, is that you don't wash your hands of something once you've invested. You have to watch and steward and curate it and make sure communities are involved. 
Um, and I think that we can, if we incentivize companies to also set nature targets alongside their net zero targets, biodiversity targets, if we think holistically in terms of our sustainability outcomes, and if we incentivize companies by rewarding them for their contributions outside of their own little inventory challenge, little big inventory challenge, then I think we can start reframing this discussion. But I really just want to say I appreciate everyone's efforts because they all come from a position of wanting higher integrity. Thanks, Kaya. Laura? You're muted. I think Laura. You, thank you, Laura. Still, you're still muted, Laura. Thank you. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm so sorry about that. Um, I would really wish for indigenous people's uh, representatives and you know a large scale of representatives to be able to speak to these things coming from indigenous peoples. It's not that I'm not saying I don't have the right to speak on what is happening because we work with communities, but I, I go back to respect for rights of indigenous people, the right to be informed, included and informed consent so that we are able to articulate how all of these different global programs, plans can also be reflected in the country, at the country level, but really what we should be taking to the international level based on what should be very um, progressive human rights approaches that we can hold our governments on before going forward and making commitments at the international level. Things like that I think can work if only we are informed properly and respect is given because as again, as I said, decisions that are made is impacting indigenous people's rights, our food security, um, land tenure security and everything else, because again, what we can contribute as our from our way of life need to be centered and not only focused on numbers and figures, which are important, but really it needs to be a combination of all of us on the table as, as, as partners, as important partners. Yeah. Thanks, Laura. And finally, Pedro. Yeah, uh, Patrick, uh, without taking it personally, I, I, like I said, I've been 20 years uh, trying to fix the, the, the market. So probably I, you know, according to your the premise of your question, maybe I should just step down. I'll still keep going at it. Uh, but I, but to your point, I do think that the conversation, even on carbon markets, and regardless of, um, uh, of what Kaya just said, if we are going to have a carbon market of whatever sort, it will need more regulation. Um, and I'm convinced that the ICVCM and VCMI and, and to an extent SPTI is kind of framing the demand are, are important steps. Are they enough? We'll have to wait and see. And most likely at some point, we will have to bring in other types of regulation. Um, and we're already seeing uh, this is a market that has been going on without regulation for too long. Um, and we're already seeing some uh, interventions uh, very recently from financial regulators and others around that that uh, uh, lack of regulation. So um, yeah, so maybe I, I, I need to step down and some other uh, regulator comes in and I can move uh, elsewhere. Thank you very much. Well, on that note, um, thank, thank you very much um, to all four of our panelists. I think uh, everyone can agree that was a very interesting discussion and genuinely we heard uh, a lot of different perspectives and a lot of different points and the thing is we've actually had far too many questions come in clearly people are very engaged with this um if possible I mean Barbara has already alluded to this um we will we've got a, a long list of questions and we will direct those to our panelists and there's absolutely no pressure at all but if um if the mood takes you to respond to any of those questions we can include them in the we'll do a, a quick write-up of this this um, webinar afterwards so we can include your responses in that um, but yeah, thank you once again. And just to say this is marking the end of uh, a week long series that Carbon Brief has done on, on carbon offsets. Um, please check out all of the, the uh, pieces we've been working on. We've got lots of original analysis, um, explainers. If any of the, uh, uh, the words mentioned in that, in that webinar um, uh, were confusing to you, we have a glossary to help you understand all the different terms involved. 
Um, but yeah, thank you once again. And um, yeah, goodbye. Have a wonderful day.